Hi everyone, I'm Linda Sheldon Fell with the International Grief Institute and this is Moments of Hope. Tonight we're sitting with Mary Lee Robinson. Mary Lee is a author, a prolific writer and founder of uh, Set an Extra Plate as well as Widow Lucian. So welcome to the show, Mary Lee. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I've been looking forward to this all week. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, we're talking tonight about something that is very near and dear to your heart because you've lived it. Uh, it, it also affects millions of people around the world, and that is widow safety and security. And so you lost your husband, Pat, in 2013 rather unexpectedly. And right. it puts you into uh, what over 700,000 women in America become widows every single year. And just like you, 70% of them live alone. Right. And that has to come with a lot of fear. And before we move into the strategies that you have to offer on widow safety and security, I want to tell viewers that tonight for the first time, uh, we are inviting viewers to join us on the show and share your own story about whether you've been scammed or uh, faced a, you know something that threatened your safety as a widow, you can click on the link there um, in the thread of Facebook uh, slash Grief Institute on the Be Live link. And that will bring you in. We'll hold you in the lobby until we can bring you on and you've got three minutes to share your story. And uh, we hope you can join us. So Mary Lee, when you became a widow in 2013, of course, you know, Pat, your husband died unexpectedly. So it was, uh, you thought you had retired and bought your dream home and were about ready to spend your golden years together enjoying one another's company out on your patio overlooking the water. And that is not what happened. And so once the dust settled, what was some of the realizations that you came to about being a widow? I was stunned by how many changes there were. Um, mm -hmm. I'd been single for an awful lot of years before I married for the first time. Um, Pat, my late husband, was my the love of my life, and he was my second husband. But I was 33 when I got married for the first time. So I had a lot of time being solo, and this was very different. Um, I think that what concerned me the most initially was my physical safety because I was in a brand new community that was being developed and the nearest house was a quarter of a mile away and they could not hear my security alarm. And there were all kinds of contractors and uh, kids roaming around the neighborhood at night. And it was, it was pretty alarming. Um, so that was the first thing that struck me. And that, that's circumstantial. Not everybody's going to have that. And certainly uh, widows who live in communities where they're well established and they know their neighbors really well will be a little more comforted than than I was. But I was in a, a brand new land and uh, didn't have anybody around me to speak of. And my chief of security walked off the job. So yeah, um, you I have a lot of that. And uh, I... Uh, I took some some measures. One of the first ones was something I recommend for everybody. And that's get a dog. Um, I have a small elderly dachshund who I adore, but um, he'd lick everybody to death. <laughs> so I got another dog. And in my case, I had the room and the the yard to accommodate her. But I have a Rottweiler. Um, mm -hmm. She's sh she's very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> but don't tell anybody. Yeah, she, you, you see a Rottweiler, and friendliness is not the first thing. That not the first thing that pops to your mind. That's a pretty um, good parent, right there. It is, and it's funny. People will come up to me, particularly the the construction guys, will say, "Is she friendly?" Not to you, <laughs> no. And I'm sure most of them mean no harm, but I'm by myself, and. Yeah. You know, I don't have a backup, so I just can't be too careful. Um, so and I've so learned to be very careful. Did you, did you love Rottweilers or, or did you say, okay, I'm going to go out and get the best guard dog I can? Is that how I you I've never had a Rottweiler before. Um, interesting question. And Pat must have had some sort of premonition because in the fall 
before he died, about six months before he died, he kept telling me, if something happens to me, I want you to get a Doberman or a Rottweiler. Um, and I, I thought that was odd because he'd only ever had one dog in his life, and that was a poodle. Um, I've always had dachshunds, and they're great dogs. They were particularly great apartment dogs, but friends recommended a Rottweiler, and I was a little a little intimidated by the idea of such a big dog. But uh, now that she's full grown in 130 pounds, she wow. is just a joy. She is the happiest dog I've ever had. And um, it just, she has no idea how scary she is. <laughs> and she'd be stunned if you told her. So, um, <laughs> so it works out fine. But um, even if you can't manage a big dog, a little dog is another set of ears at night. Right. Uh, one of the biggest fears that I had was if I went soundly to sleep, that I might not hear somebody approaching the house. Um, I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> Just having yeah. a dog in the house helps. Right, because their sense of hearing is keen, yes. keen. And so, um, and so what, what strategies do you recommend for someone who can't have a dog either because of their living situation or they're allergic or they're just, they're, they have a fear that they can't overcome of dogs? Well, there's, it's multi-layered and uh, I have a security system. We had that when, when we built the house. So that helps. Um, while I was out here by myself, I did something really, really unique, but totally legal. I have um, some speakers outside and I created an iPad, um, iPod loop of shotgun sounds. So when the construction workers were littering around and loitering around and wouldn't go home in a timely manner, I'd turn my outside speakers on and they got the idea. Oh my gosh. That's fantastic. So when did you hear that? I, I don't know. I just thought about it. It's just what would scare me off. And that was it. It's like, you know, somebody starts, I, I start to hear shotguns and shots. I'm gone. So yeah, it, yeah. it was pretty effective. I um, know that you can buy the, uh, their alarms that you put in a car. I don't know what they're called, but if someone tries to open an unlock car, if they get too close to the car, uh, it can uh, be a, someone's voice saying, get away from the car. Um, right. And so I don't know if they make that for front doors, but that would also be something that would be quite useful. There are wireless security systems out there now that you can install yourself that are pretty, pretty reasonable that have window alarms um, and they get great reviews. Uh, mine's hardwired, but I think the wireless ones are a great solution for widows because they don't require a lot of, of skills that your husband had, but took with them. Um, right. You can put right. those in yourself. The other thing I did when there were a lot of um, strangers roaming around and I was the only one out here was I went to the Goodwill store and I bought about two or three pairs of really large boots and sneakers and a couple of shirts, plaid shirts and work shirts and such. And I would change them out and I would leave a copy of the newspaper on the table out front along with a beer can. And I, the display would would change, so it was not so conspicuous that I was here by myself. Right. So you staged the scene. I staged the front so porch like you had a big burly um, right. partner. Baseball it. cap hanging on the chair, the whole thing. Very clever. Um, Very it, clever. It helped. I also um, my circumstances were a little different because I was really isolated. My police department was fabulous. I let them know that I was concerned and that there were folks roaming around more than they needed to be because there was no reason for them to be back close to where I was. And you were on a dead end or a cul-de-sac or? Uh, yes, I'm on a peninsula and roads lead to nowhere. So okay. um, there was no reason for them to be back here at night. And my police department was wonderful once I, I let them know what I was concerned about and what my circumstances were, they'd stop by pretty often. Now they'll tell you that they can't do that. They can't give you special treatment, but they did. So, um, and I don't need them now I've got neighbors. So that helped a lot. Um, 
I also learned to be really circumspect about who I gave my my information to. Um, anymore, if you go into a hardware store or a retail store, they'll ask you for your phone number. Don't give them your phone number that's connected to your landline with your address. They don't need to have that. If you've got a mobile phone, try and get it billed someplace else like a post office box um, or give them a phony number. I, I have one that I have memorized. I don't give them my real number because there's no need for them to have that information. Um, if it's a number you can remember, they can still look up your account and your purchases, but they don't need to know where you live. Yeah, that's very interesting. As long as it's the same number, uh, so you can reap the rewards of you know those reward cards and such. Um, I guess that there's no reason to have it be your authentic number. Um, right. But I, you know, I had never thought about that. That the clerk, I guess, with a few finger strokes, he or she could access your physical address. Right. And you know, you just you just can't be too safe these days. You know, people are very clever when they want to scam someone or they think someone's vulnerable. Right. So, yeah. Wow. I just had a uh, uh, alarming experience personally, which is what brought this topic up for me again. And that is that I've tried very, very hard in the recent years to keep that information below the radar and just discovered while pursuing um, a project through my neighborhood that my address and my name were open to the public and I did a, a Google search and found it on 25 sites. Now I have since had that scrubbed with a lot of time and effort and some money but be really really careful who you give that information to and and watch um, in the, the people search sites. It used to be that you had to go pay money to get that information but they kind of flash that all over the place now. Anybody who's got a mortgage in their own name, has applied for a utility in their own name, um, has a telephone billed to their home, your number's out there and your address may be too. And you probably want to see what you can do to get, get that taken down. Um, yeah, you know, most of us think we're invincible. Yes. That, oh, well, you know, no harm will come. And yet there are scams that... Uh, they come up with new ones all the time. Yes. Because as people uh, fall victim to it and, you know, lose uh, millions of dollars, uh, you know, a combination between all the different victims and such, the scammers then, you know, change it because they always want to stay one step ahead. Of course. And so you can never be too safe. So. Well, and the internet is, is evolving daily. Um, right. I'm old enough to remember when single ladies or solo ladies or widowed ladies would get their phone listed with the phone company and just use their first initials. And the phone company at their request would not publish their address. And they didn't charge extra for that. That was just a courtesy to right. ladies who, who didn't need to have that all splashed out in the, the world. Well, That's now right. it's splashed even broader circumstances and, uh, I don't see a whole lot of good that goes with that. Um, when it, I had a discussion with some of my uh, widows on my Facebook page about, wouldn't it be nice if some of the service companies or the hardware companies would offer a discount to widows? And then somebody brought up the point that then you're telling everybody and tipping your hat that you are a widow. And that might not be the smartest thing to do. And mm. um, safety and security is something that a lot of people don't really think of and don't talk about much because like everything else related to grief, it seems we all think we're the only ones with that problem. Right. All right. But we need to talk about it. Right. Right. And, you know, there are simple ways. Uh, if you don't want to go out and get a Rottweiler or if you, you know, don't want to invest in, uh, you know, a, some kind of wireless system that you know tells them to back away from the front door or what have you there's simple things that they can do um what are some of those things that that you know you educate widowers on i i uh always i'm thinking like leaving the you know leaving a light on inside 
um, not changing the answering machine. Um, yes. And widows get hammered a bit about uh, taking their rings off. Uh, My personal choice is that I want to wear them because I'm still consider myself married to my husband. Now, not everybody does, and that's fine. If you want to date, that's great. Um, but having my rings on discourages some conversations and it needs an impression that um, might not uh, uh, start a conversation that might not otherwise occur. So I, I like the comfort of having them on for that reason. Um, yeah. But that goes along with not changing your, your uh, answering message, your greeting. If your husband's voice is on that, people will give you a hard time telling you they think it's creepy, but it's also safer. Um, it is safer. Yeah. Uh, in fact, talking about the, the phone book, um, I have a, a widow friend who she's been widowed now for many, many years. But uh, in the phone book, she's still listed under her husband's name. Yep. And it's a safety thing for her. And yeah. also, you know, wearing the wedding rings, there are some, you know, some widows wear it for comfort. And there's absolutely no reason why they would take it off uh, or, or need to take it off. Uh, there is some pressure by society yeah. to say, you know, why are you still wearing those kind of thing? Well, you know, um, that's a personal issue. However, the moment you take it off, you become vulnerable in the eyes of those who are looking yes. uh, through predatory eyes. Yes. If they're looking to scam you, if they're looking at you now as a vulnerable person, where if you're wearing your wedding rings, you're not as vulnerable because you've got a one plus who's got your back. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that the wedding ring is, is really valuable information, Mary Lee. And thank you for that. I, I hadn't thought about it. I was thinking about things, you know, outside. What can you do? Um, you know, leaving the lights on. I love your idea of, you know, cowboy boots. You could leave cowboy boots at the front door. You could. <laughs> you know, um, just outside the front door, a pair of mud boots or something. Um, if, if I'm engaging in a conversation with someone I don't know well about maybe work around my house, um, and I haven't contracted for them to do it yet. And we have to do that a lot more because half our labor force is gone too. Um, things that I used to be able to manage with an extra set of hands, I need to call somebody to help me with now or do. Um, and if I don't know them, when I'm first kind of screening them, I'll refer to my husband and occasionally I might call into the house, call his name, um, just to give the impression that somebody's around Mm -hmm. um, I certainly do that if I'm uneasy. And it, uh, one of the things I would encourage, um, particularly new widows, fresh widows to do is pay attention to your gut. If something doesn't feel right, probably something isn't right. And it's wow. better to be um, safe than, than push those feelings away and be, and be mistaken. Um, you know, you might feel silly, get over it. If it doesn't feel right, excuse yourself, get out of the situation, do what you need to do. But, um, there's radar going off for a reason. Right. So. That's right. Your internal radar is, is saying something. And you know, there are people who read the obituaries to, for the purpose of predatory, um, purposes. And, yep. and so, you know, they, they look through there and, and it's true when we lost our daughter, uh, local police said, we will watch your house while you were at the, the funeral service. Yeah. And I remember thinking, Oh, I would have never thought about that. And they do, they will position two policemen at your house uh, because it's usually posted when the service is going to be and people read that and they think, Oh, there's going to be nobody home at that house. Right. And so same thing for widows. There are people who read the newspaper obits to see who's newly widowed. Let's mark her down. And in a couple of months, uh, you know, let's, you know, scam this, that, the other. And, you know, sadly, because widows are vulnerable, uh, it, and they're certainly not the only vulnerable uh, population, um, but they have different, uh, you know, losses than other people who are vulnerable. I, I, and so, you know, the people look for that and target that vulnerability. 
and you know it's it's sad but it's it's today's world it is the it modern is. times it's not a it's not a safe yeah. world like it and, and people fall to it to the tune of millions of dollars and a yeah. lot of that comes from um social media yes. online media and and i would encourage um anyone who's widowed to participate in in social media you'll meet and talk to people there who get you much more than people in the neighborhood who haven't had that loss. Um, it's a quantum leap for somebody who's not had that loss to understand why you're not over it yet. You know, right. Um, right. and you can find that support on social media. So I think social media is very, very valuable. And you can find some Facebook groups, um, grief diaries, um, the International Grief Institute. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of them out there. Um, I do Pinterest boards with practical tips for widows and widowers. And that's kind of my niche is I'm, I approach it from a very practical area, but you'll find tips and things that your friends can't tell you and they can't share with you. Um, but be careful about it. If, if you were at a, a cocktail party in the neighborhood and somebody that you didn't really know and nobody else knew wanted to be your friend, would you be their friend? you know, you want to find out a little bit more about them. Yeah. Um, and you really want to screen them. Yeah. Um, my personal policy is I don't, I keep my personal Facebook page, a very tight group right now. I think it's 25 people and all of them are people that I've met in person in real life and have known a good while. There are one or two in that group that I've never met face to face, but we participated maybe in a, uh, special interest group and we've been talking back and forth for six years and like, okay, we should be personal friends by now. But if somebody reaches out to you and you don't know anything about them and they want to be your friend, delete them. Just forget yeah. that. There's yeah. it, it, You want to surround like, yourself with support yeah. and, you know, people that who have your back. Yes. So, um, and you are, you know, your work on Pinterest is phenomenal. You have uh, recipes for one. Um, you've got all kinds of helpful hints on there. Really done a, a phenomenal job. How do they find you on Pinterest? I uh, I am at Pinterest. Um, dot com backslash m h o c t six four six two and backslash boards. We'll we'll post it. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm more of a curator there than than uh, an original material. Although a lot of my original material is there too. But I've gathered together information on safety and security, on um, eating alone, on dining out by yourself. There are some tips. Um, how to reinvent yourself now that you don't have to dress for your spouse. Um, there are some upsides. You get some freedoms and get to experiment with some things. And there's ways to do that. And if you are freshly widowed or maybe a little further out, it's a good time to, to decide who you are. And there are some boards that address that, um, as well as some some recommended reading. And you and I both know several that are excellent in the Grief Diary series. Yeah. Um, but I would also suggest that anybody who is facing life by themselves for the first time in a long, long time, develop your computer skills and get really good at research on the computer. Um, Pinterest is a wonderful resource. Um, most marriages are are sort of a division of labor. Not that you're incapable of doing what your husband did or he was incapable of doing what you did, but there's a natural division of labor and all of a sudden your half your labor force is gone. So you're gonna have to learn how to do some new things. And uh, Google searches and Pinterest and some of YouTube are wonderful resources for learning how to do that, for example. Um, maybe it wasn't your job to buy car insurance and all of a sudden you have to buy car insurance. If you just type in on Google, how do I buy car insurance? They'll, you'll come up with like four articles on what to look for and what the pricing should be like. Um, same thing for how do I replace the, the floater ball in the toilet if it jams up or how do I unstop the garage door or just any number of things. Um, if you if that wasn't your your purview before, you can learn how to do it, and you may have to. 
Um, security tips for sure. Keeping your bushes cut back away from the front door so there's no place for anybody to hide. Right. Um, and there's just a wealth of material on that kind of thing if you look it up. And uh, I occasionally get widows who will tell me, well, I'm, I don't, I don't want to learn how to do the computer. It's not going away. It's not a trendy thing. Email was invented in 1979. That was 45 years ago. It's just going to keep up picking up speed. So the smartest thing you could do is jump in and do what everybody else did. And that's just get on there and learn how to do it by clicking buttons and exploring and research is the best thing you can do. And you'll be teaching some of this on the uh, bereavement cruise 2019. Yes. And specifically you were giving a couple of presentations for widows. And yes. so that's fantastic. How can people find information about the cruise and attend your workshops there? Um, I'm not sure what the sign up process is for specific work workshops, but the information for the cruise to the Western Caribbean with a bunch of uh, folks that we know real well um, is found at uh, Journey of Hope and Health. And you can find some postings on your site, on my Pinterest boards, on the Grief Toolbox. Um, I bet you have some on International Grief Institute right now. Um, look for the journeys of hope health and healing or bereavement cruise or google it and you'll pop up the information yeah it, if, if nothing else google bereavement cruise yep. and it'll be top of the list it'll be right up there but i think I it's am. fantastic that you're offering that presentations on this um you know it's it's one thing to google it and and find out tidbits on the internet and that's great but to learn it one-on-one -on -one with someone who's been there and you know, you talked about some tips tonight that I would have never thought of. And so attending your workshop, coming on the cruise, surrounding yourself with 20 different experts, and most importantly for widows to have the opportunity to sit with you and, I look you know, forward to that. and surround them with love, uh, speak their lost language and say, I've been where you are right now and I'm sure glad you're here. And, and teach them how to protect themselves, how to protect themselves physically at home, and you know how to protect themselves uh, online you know which is Where growing online you know uh, activity uh, illegal activities growing at an alarming rate and uh, you know so seem to be all housed in nigeria <laughs> there's a whole nest of them in nigeria um but one of the things i want to talk about on these workshops um as i said i i sort of focus on the practical aspects but how to find your tribe. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you have people around you that you've known all, all your life with your spouse, you may find that they're not quite as supportive as you thought they might be. You might need to find support elsewhere. And, and I will talk about some ways to find that support, but it's important that you have it, particularly if you live alone, um, you need to build a, a circle of friends that will notice if you are not uh, visible on social media or they haven't heard from you when they regularly do or can take you to the uh, doctor's office for a procedure when you can't drive yourself home. Those are things that you probably didn't have to face before, but you're going to have to build that network now. So right. um, one of the things I'm excited about doing in these workshops is making it very back and forth. Um, I've got a number of, of situations and some solutions. And then I want to hear from the audience about what they can brainstorm about what, how would they approach this situation and what would they do about it? Because we always learn from our followers and our, our uh, class attendees more than we ever give them. So yeah. this should be a lot of, a lot of fun having attended um, the first one didn't get a 10 to the second cruise, but the first one was just a hoot. It was so much fun. Um, well, it's, it's quite fun because people will say bereavement cruise. What's that? Right. Well, you know, cruises are, uh, there's so many different themes and groups going on cruises and you know, what a wonderful way to meet new people 
and learn from people who share a common interest. Well, why not a bereavement cruise? And so this next year will be the third year and it keeps growing and growing and growing. And, and it's not just for widows. Uh, yeah, and it's not just for widows, it's for anyone yeah. who has lost someone they love. Um, I will be there as well presenting. And one of the presentations that I'm very excited about, and you'll be in there um, with us as part of it, is um, you know, lady time. And it will just be us ladies. Cool. And that will be interactive. And I think that that is so important. People can uh, share their only their own concerns and their stories. And, uh, you know, us panel ladies can guide them and, and um, you know, help people sort through what challenges they're facing. And I think that's really important. So I'm very excited about the cruise. You've been on one before. This I is my first. So and you love it. Um, one of the things that was especially um, appealing to me was that it is such a non-judgmental group. You know, everybody had walked their own path and had known their own sorrow. And not only were able to honor that sorrow, but were ready to come up for air a little bit and have some fun. And we did. Um, but beyond just the confines of that group, I'm looking forward to the swing dance lessons. The, the cruise offers us some dance lessons, and I haven't done that since Pat passed, so I can't wait to do that again. Um, there's all kinds of things going on on the ship that um, sound like a tremendous amount of fun, but you'll see me on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> so we can find you on the dance floor. That's where I'll be. If you want me over there. <laughs> Fun. How fun. I, you know, and what, what's really cool about it is those who come on the cruise, you know, the cruise will have over 5,000 people and our bereavement group, I cruise is, you know, we're, we're a, a small uh, segment of that. And so uh, people who come on the bereavement cruise can still access all the rest of the, the um, right. cruise ship and all the fun things that I, uh, you know, it, it, they'll be able to do. And so it's really, really cool. I'm very excited about it. So viewers, so if you are joining us now and you've got a story to share about uh, being scammed or you know facing vulnerability as a widow uh click on the live tv link and we'll bring you on to the show and give you a few minutes to share your story everyone is welcome I, and it's super easy to join us um and so mary lee i what do you think is the biggest challenge facing widowers today um you know widows are I, you know a, a group of women who suddenly lose a spouse and along with that, they often lose their friends, uh, the, the primary income. Uh, yeah, yeah. Many end up having to transition out of the home that they loved with their spouse because they can't afford to keep it anymore and they have to sell it. Um, you know, what do you, what was the biggest shock for you? And it came immediately. Um, our culture has, has morphed into a society that is so terrified of death and the concept of it that we don't support our widows or our grievers very well at all. Um, one of the co-authors on my first book said, where were all those casseroles? Because she didn't get any. And actually, neither did I. I was left quite a lot alone. And, Is that right? Uh, that's that's my, one of my many soapboxes. You helped me um, get the National Set an Extra Plate Initiative going. Mm -hmm. And that was... Part of addressing that, I almost spent every holiday the first year by myself, all by myself, because people didn't think to include me. And I was appalled by that because growing up, we had um, people who were alone or maybe in town for a, a temporary assignment or, but in some circumstance away from their family, either widowed or just transported. We had a table full at our ha our house every holiday, even though it was just my dad and my mom and I. Um, we had an Egyptian doctor who was a regular. He was the resident at my mother's hospital where she worked. We had uh, we had a banker, we had policemen, we had teachers, and we had a shepherd pretty frequently. <laughs> there was a Scotsman in my hometown that was in our social circle, and uh, he was off the boat Scottish. And he was still a shepherd in my hometown, and he was a frequent guest. So I met some really, really interesting people because we included them in our holidays. And I well, was 
let's done share with our viewers. viewers. Let's share with our viewers what that initiative I did. set an extra plate. The whole let's idea share. behind because the holidays are just around the corner. They are, and it isn't just the major holidays. Um, pretty much other every holiday, if you're having a party, invite a widow, invite a widower. Um, if you think they'll be uncomfortable, they'd probably rather be uncomfortable in your party than uncomfortable sitting with their memories all by themselves. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, um, if you invite them and they say no, that's fine. But at least they know they were thought of. Yeah, uh, that they were that they're welcome and they might change their mind. And, yes. you know, that first couple of years after losing a loved one is just incredibly painful. And especially the holidays, they're like pouring Ooh. salt on the wound. And so yeah. set an extra plate. You know, how much more food do you It doesn't need? cost any extra. Um, it doesn't yeah. involve any more work. You're cooking anyway. You're going to have um, at the table set anyway. Just put an extra plate and invite a neighbor, a co-worker, somebody you know from church, somebody you know from a club. And you might not even know them all that well, but I assure you they will be tickled pink that you thought about them. Um, like I said, they may or may not come, but it is so nice to be remembered. And to our viewers who are widows and widowers themselves, the flip side of that is if somebody invites you to a, a party, you may not feel like going it, go anyway. Yep. Accept that invitation. Even if you can only stay, stand there for 10 minutes, get out of the house, yep. go, or those invitations are going to stop. People will stop asking you. And that's not really what is good in the long run. So that's right. get out of your own head for 10 minutes. If you get weepy or you get maudlin or you get, you feel like a, a third wheel, make a polite uh, you know, excuse and, and scoot out of there fairly early. But And your host and hostess will usually understand just fine. But make the effort to go and they'll try again. But it's a, it's a two way street. You have to um, you have to make the effort, and people in the community community have to make the outreach. Um, that used to be kind of a, an accepted practice, and we've gotten away from that. I'm not real sure why. But we've also gotten away from the year of mourning. And while I don't recommend going back to black clothes for a year, at least it was a reminder that to treat somebody who's had a major loss with a little bit of tenderness yeah. instead of it's been 48 hours. Are you over it yet? Cause it doesn't work that way. Well, and, and part of it is because, you know, in today's world and in corporate America, most HR policies allow three days. Yes. And, you yeah. know, that's barely enough time to plan a funeral, let alone, right. I, you know, find your wits about it. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, we're, you know, but we're, we're shifting that pendulum. We're working hard to raise awareness about uh, grief journeys because it's been around since the beginning of mankind and we shouldn't be afraid of it. We should be better equipped than we are. And by talking about it, just as we are tonight, um, you know, there are millions of people who've lost someone they love and they need to know that they're not alone and how do they deal with it? How do we deal with it? You know? Well, and uh, you know, if you think about it, we study and and practice for our driver's license. We go to counseling before we get married. Um, we study before exams in college to to graduate or or trade school or whatever it is that your particular interest is. But nobody prepares us for the loss of someone you love, and uh, that's really unrealistic because all of us at some point or other are going to lose someone we love. That's right. And That's I really believe that um, not talking about it and shying away from it and sticking your head in the sand only makes it worse. Yeah. Um, yep. If you, if well you recognize that it's a natural occurrence, then it's a little easier to deal with. Well, the more awareness that we raise as well, uh, the, the more, uh, people become comfortable with it and we learn to do a better job supporting future generations so that you know someone who goes through what we have gone through uh, won't feel 
the way that we had to feel, you know, such with widows losing their friends, their Rolodex right. changes pretty quick and the different safety and security things that you're faced with that you would never think of. And uh, so that's the, the reason why we all do what we do is to make a difference for future Absolutely. generations. So we don't have any guests who are willing to j j join us tonight and share their stories about being scammed or about their safety and security as a widow. But I wanna thank you, Mary Lee, for joining me and bringing this up. It's a very important topic. And where can viewers find you? I, right now, my Facebook page is down. Unfortunately, I had this little security problem. But Pinterest is the best place to find my uh, my work along with my website, okay. which is um, also under construction with some de some difficulties right now. But there's a lot of material you can find there. There are a lot of blog posts. And that's at WIDS, W-I-D-S, nextdoor.com. Okay. Right. And there's a wealth of material there. Um, I seem seem to have something new to say all every day, and whether you, anybody wants to hear it or not, <laughs> it's all wonderful information, quite needed. So, where can they? What's the easiest way for viewers to find you on Pinterest? Pinterest.com, M H O C T six four six two backslash okay. boards. And if it's okay, we'll post that on this Facebook link when we uh, sign off. Yeah. Um, and for and, the bereavement cruise, to so join us on the bereavement cruise and right. sit with Mary Lee and uh, soak up her wisdom about being a widow and uh, all the different strategies that she can offer, uh, Google bereavement cruise and it will come right up. You can also go to griefdiaries.com and click on the link there. But you want to make sure that you reference uh, that you're there to see Mary Lee. And uh, that way they'll they'll be sure to hook you in with Mary Lee. And that's that that's for don't really forget important. our marvelous books. If What's you don't that? know what to do for a griever, we wrote one about that. Um, how to have how to help the newly bereaved and uh, loss of a spouse. And my first one was the widow or widower next door. And they can yeah. all be found on Grief Toolbox. And Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. Yep. So, well, thanks so much for joining me tonight, Mary Lee. I appreciate it. And we will talk soon. So much fun. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye bye, everyone. Uh, next week, our guest is uh, Dawn Tuft. Uh, she is a mother who lost three children in a house fire 18 months ago, and she is willing to share her story about how she is sifting through the ashes, literally, of her life okay. and uh, looking for hope. So join us same time next week, and we'll see you then. Have a great week. Bye-bye.